Without further ado, hepatitis C has been in the news a whole heck of a lot. It's, it, I think it's the number one cause of cirrhosis now in the United States. Uh, and there, with the recent developments of new drug therapy, I, it may very well become a primary care problem for us to diagnose and treat. To discuss this topic, I can think of no one better qualified than our first speaker today, and that's Dr. Stephen Hahn. Dr. Hahn is a professor of medicine and surgery at UCLA, uh, specializing in liver transplants. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Kwan and the entire CME group for inviting me out to speak today. Um, so as Dr. Kwan said, uh, hepatitis C is, um, you know, I think you're witnessing really a, a very rare um, event here in your lifetime, your professional lifetime. Uh, essentially, the, the the discovery of a disease, hepatitis C, and then uh, the cure of the disease, all, all within the last 20 years or so. So it's really an amazing thing. I can't think of anything else similar, except that hepatitis C will probably be like smallpox. It'll be a thing of the past in the next few years. And as I'll explain, the treatment is so simple that it very well could be a primary care thing. So um, the, way, the way hepatitis C is now, it's still a, a big problem. Um, there are probably closer to, I would say, 5 million Americans, or 2% of the population are chronic hepatitis C carriers. So um, there's quite a burden uh, of chronic hepatitis C here in the US. So um, currently, hepatitis C is still the leading cause of liver transplant. And, um, can anyone guess in 2018 what will become the number one cause of liver transplant in the United States? Fatty liver, exactly. So hepatitis C will be gone, but we have fatty liver to, to keep us busy for at least a, a long time. And then Dr. DeRaza will discuss that in the next talk. <clears throat> uh, hepatitis C costs a lot of money, and this is a very old slide, um, but clearly, um, medical costs are more expensive now with liver transplants and all the complications related to hepatitis C. Um, we're looking at well over billions of dollars, I would say, in healthcare costs for the treatment of chronic hepatitis C. So you have to just kind of keep that in mind when we come to the treatment of hepatitis C because many of you probably read in the media about you know, the thousand dollar a pill cure for hepatitis C. Um, I do think we have to look at the, the, the whole cost uh, in, in the big picture. Is it cheaper to treat a patient now versus let them go on to end-stage liver disease? Um, so hepatitis C is, uh, in the United States, still considered low prevalence. So you can see the U.S. is still green. So we're in about the 2% the prevalence rate in the United States. The high prevalence rates are still in Asia, Africa, um, where the prevalence can be as high as uh, 10%. So um, we have a smaller burden here, um, but still um, there's about 5 million Americans who have chronic hepatitis C. And um, so it's, it's a big problem. Now, I'll just briefly show you this. Uh, this is kind of a... Um, the molecular structure of hepatitis C, and you can basically see that it's composed of a lot of different proteins, um, envelope proteins, proteases, um, non-structural, that's, that's the NS345 proteins. The only reason I show you this is, is because these were the targets. These are the targets of all of our current new treatments. So when we, when we discuss the management of hepatitis C with the new drugs, these new drugs are directed specifically at the NS5, NS3, and the protease enzymes of this uh, virus. And by knocking down these enzymes, you can knock out the virus. Now, the big issue with hepatitis C, the reason why, it, uh, the reason why we don't have a vaccine for hepatitis C 
uh, is because it's a very heterogeneous virus. There are many different genotypes, uh, six, at least six different genotypes, and even more quasi-species of hepatitis C. So any one patient with hepatitis C actually has a mixed population of uh, different quasi-species and, and different um, populations of genotypes. There, there tends to be one dominant genotype, but every patient is a mixed. So it's very hard to come up with a vaccine that will cover all the genotypes, all the quasi-species, but they're still working on that. But if you think about it now in the big picture, I mean, a lot of people have gotten very cavalier about it, even saying, well, who, who, you know, who cares about a vaccine because we can, you know, we can cure you now. If you get hepatitis C, no big deal. Take this pill and you'll be cured. So this is how uh, the different genotypes are distributed in the world. And um, in the United States, we still have predominantly genotype 1. And genotype 1, 1A, 1B are the most common. And the, the problem with genotype 1 is it was always the most difficult to treat with our previous drugs of interferon. Um, but that's also kind of fallen by the wayside now with the new the new, the new medications. But this just shows you that hepatitis C is a very heterogeneous um, virus. So how does one get hepatitis C? Um, you still need to get hepatitis B by some sort of parenteral blood exposure. So the number one cause is still intravenous drug use. That's, that's the number one risk factor. And then you have sexual contacts, uh, transfusions, household contacts, they get smaller. Uh, and then there was a big part of the pie called other, which we didn't know uh, what was in other until recently we found out, well, this includes people who have used intranasal cocaine, you know, tattoos, history of STDs, prison inmates, very high prevalence of hepatitis C. U.S. veterans, you know, Vietnam era vets, 30% have chronic hepatitis C. So these are the risk factors that, um, that we previously recommended that uh, we screen for hepatitis C. You have to ask the patient about these risk factors, and if they had any of these risk factors, um, the CDC said that we should be screening them for hepatitis C. Now the problem is, you know, this is what we were supposed to do, but you know, we were not doing a very good job because there were a lot of uh, hepatitis C out there that we were not diagnosing. So, um, so the, the, the recommendations used to be ask for the risk factors. If the patients ever had abnormal liver tests, um, screen for hepatitis C. Um, but we were missing them. So um, more recently, uh, the CDC came out with this new recommendation, which is now the recommendation for screening for hepatitis C is called the birth is is called screening the birth cohort, which essentially says that if your patient <clears throat> was a baby boomer, born between 1945 and 1965, all baby boomers uh, must be screened for hepatitis C, and that's just the flat out recommendation now. I mean, still. Obviously, if your patient has risk factor, abnormal liver test, you still need to be screened. But just being a baby boomer is enough to warrant a screen for hepatitis C. So these days, when we uh, say screen, we, we recommend that you actually check for the virus. You can, we have very good PCR-based assays now. You can directly check for the virus. Uh, that's the recommendation because <clears throat> you can check for the antibody, which is very good, but there is a high rate of false positivity of the antibody test. And actually, we all just basically confirm uh, it's easiest to just actually check for the virus now. So if you have a patient with hepatitis C, uh, there are some recommendations to avoid further transmission. It's mainly um, um, uh, prevention of uh, passing on contaminated blood. So uh, for example, uh, no donation of blood, organs, etc. cetera. Uh, patients with a history of multiple sexual partners are advised to use condoms. Um, no change in sexual practices in, in patients who are involved in long-term monogamous relationships. There's been shown to be no correlation 
uh, with no increased risk of hepatitis C in couples who are in a long-term monogamous relationship, only those who have a history of multiple sexual partners. Uh, avoid sharing razors, toothbrushes, cover open wounds, any way that hepatite, uh, contaminated blood can be passed. Um, household uh, family members should be advised to avoid these things. Uh, no reason to avoid hugging, kissing, sharing, eating utensils. Those are not ways that hepatitis C is passed on and, and pregnancy is not um, a risk factor for hepatitis C transmission. So here's hepatitis C. And if you look at the 20-year progression of hepatitis C, you'll see that most people, if they come in, contamin if they come in contact with contaminated blood or uh, have a risk factor, uh, most people who get acute hepatitis C will go on to develop chronic hepatitis C. But out of everyone with chronic hepatitis C, only 20% will, for the most part, progress onto cirrhosis. And out of that, only about 20% will progress on to end-stage liver disease or develop liver cancer. So, so actually, it's only the 20% of 20% that will do poorly with hepatitis C. So just getting hepatitis C does not, is not a, a death sentence or uh, is not, uh, it's not mandatory that they're going to need a liver transplant or anything like that. Only 20% of 20%. But if you think about 20% of 20% of 5 million Americans, that's still quite a lot. So every time we have a new patient come into clinic with hepatitis C, they ask me, you know, so doctor, uh, what's my risk of having problems with hepatitis C? And I say, well, 20% of 20% uh, over 20 or so years. And the next question is, well, how do I prevent myself from uh, progressing? Well, there are accelerators of hepatitis C infection. And the number one is alcoholism. So uh, if you have a hepatitis C patient, the first thing you should do is, you know, if they are a regular alcoholic consumer, uh, the best thing that you can tell them to do is to stop drinking. That will uh, give them the best chance of being in the 80% that will probably do fine. Next is fatty liver. That's a big accelerator. So obviously if a patient has the metabolic syndrome, uh, that needs to be aggressively treated. And then other conditions that uh, lead to immune suppression can also accelerate hepatitis C. So there are some basic um, lifestyle modifications and medical management that we should do with our chronic hepatitis C patients to uh, ensure that they are not one of the 20% of 20% that will have problems. So the, the natural history of chronic hepatitis C is we still believe one of asymptomatic uh, disease early on, um, and after maybe two to three decades of disease, especially in the presence of one of those accelerators of hepatitis C, um, the patient can go on to develop cirrhosis, liver cancer, with all the symptoms and signs that, that come with those. Um, but for the most part, we, we thought that hepatitis C was an asymptomatic disease. Now that, that view is changing, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Um, so most patients with chronic hepatitis C, for the most part, don't have any symptoms attributable to hepatitis C. Their liver enzymes, their liver tests can fluctuate. They can be normal, they can be uh, slightly elevated, the liver ALT, AST. Um, so that's why the recommendation was in a patient who ever had any history of abnormal ALT or AST, they should be screened. But keep in mind that just because you check a liver panel and the liver enzymes are normal, does not exclude hepatitis C, you know, especially in a patient who has a risk factor, you're still obligated to screen. So symptoms of hepatitis C, you know, there was a study that was done many years ago by the NIH that showed really that, uh, you know, the common symptoms of fatigue, pain, uh, you know, lack of energy, um, none of these uh, were found to be attributable to chronic hepatitis C. They found no significant difference between hepatitis C patients and controls. Well, that's really changing now, it seems, because um, uh, we're treating a lot of hepatitis C now, especially with the new drugs, and patients are legitimately describing um, feeling better, sleeping better, more energy, thinking clearer um, after viral clearance. 
So uh, there are a lot of studies going on now to see that perhaps uh, just having chronic hepatitis C infection, uh, there are a lot of extra hepatic manifestations and perhaps fatigue, arthritis, um, lack of energy, all these things could be related to just chronic hepatitis C infection, which is one of the arguments many have for treating hepatitis C, even in a patient who has no significant liver damage, just chronic hepatitis C. So um, by the time the patients really describe significant symptoms of itching or dark urine, that usually means cirrhosis. So you have a patient that you've diagnosed, you've screened a patient with hepatitis C, you found that they are positive for hepatitis C, uh, and there are a number of tests that we can do to decide um, what, uh, what is the degree of liver damage that they have. So we can check the liver tests, we can check the liver function tests, we can look at the ultrasound to see if they have a nodular, shrunken, cirrhotic appearing liver, uh, or we can do a biopsy to stage now, I put viral load here, and I cross it out because viral load in hepatitis C is very inaccurate. Um, the level of the viral load has been found to have no correlation with symptoms or disease progression. So what we found, in, in essence, is that the viral load just causes a lot of anxiety with the patients and sometimes with the doctors, but because their viral load was 100,000 and then the next time you check it, it's 100 million, doesn't mean that that patient is suddenly gonna need a liver transplant in a few weeks. The viral load is like the stock market. It goes up and it goes down. You have to kind of learn to ride out, ride out the, the, the peaks and the waves. So in the old days, uh, liver biopsy, that's kind of the try, that's the best way to see what, uh, what uh, the shape of a patient's liver is in. And it's the best way that we have to kind of uh, predict the future for the patient. So uh, a biopsy is very good because you can do a biopsy in a patient which allows you to stage the amount of scarring or fibrosis in their liver. So for example, you can, you know, if you biopsy a patient and you find out that they have stage two fibrosis. So stage four is cirrhosis, stage zero is normal. So let's say they have stage two, and you find out that the patient uh, acquired their hepatitis C 30 years ago from intravenous drug use. So in a way, in a very rough guesstimate, you can say, well, it took you 30 years with your current lifestyle and everything. It took you 30 years to progress two stages. So it'll be about not, not perfect, but it'll be about 30 years before you'd be expected to reach stage four cirrhosis. So if your patient is 70 years old and you biopsy them and they have stage two and you say, oh, it's gonna take you another 30 years to develop cirrhosis. So um, you shouldn't expect any problems until you're at least 100 years old. Well, a lot of patients might say, well, great. And uh, that's the, so you can see that's the best way that we use a liver biopsy to predict what's going to happen with a patient as far as their liver disease. Now, I say uh, liver biopsy is what we used to do in the past because now we have this great thing called a fibro scan. It's like an ultrasound machine, so it's not invasive. We don't have to stick needles in livers anymore. We can do this very fancy fibro scan, which uses sound waves uh, to um, very accurately stage the liver. So uh, hopefully we're gonna be getting ours at UCLA soon, and now a patient can come into clinic, and right there in the clinic I can do a quick fibro scan, get my staging, and you know, tell the patient a lot of what has happened to their liver and what's in store for them. So that's still the best way by staging the amount of fibrosis in the liver to tell a patient you know, what their hepatitis C has done and what to expect. So, um, so I spent a lot of time talking about hepatitis C and genotypes and natural history and, and all of this. And um, all of that stuff, you know, I spent all that time telling you about that and it's now getting to the point where it doesn't really kind of even matter anymore. We spent a lot of time thinking about natural history of hepatitis C and, and staging fibrosis in hepatitis C because previously the treatment for hepatitis C was so awful. Um, 
Hepatitis C treatment used to include this drug called interferon, which is something that you'd have to subcutaneously inject. The patients would have to inject themselves like an insulin shot, and they'd have to do this for sometimes up to a year. Uh, and the treatment had a lot of side effects. It didn't work very well. And so we spent a lot of time trying to stage our liver patients and think about their natural history, mainly to find ways, find reasons not to treat them because the treatment was so awful. It was like mini chemotherapy if patients have ever told you that. So we, we tried to find reasons not to treat them. But now with the evolution of hepatitis C treatment, the treatment is so easy now, it's almost as if diagnose hepatitis C, treat hepatitis C. And I'll get to that in just a minute so you'll see just how amazing this is. But here is what we have seen as far as hepatitis C treatment in literally just the last 20 or so years. So hepatitis C was discovered in 1989, 1990, uh, and we started our treatments in the early 1990s all with interferon, an injectable drug. And you can see our success rates, our cure rates were miserable. Back then, 15% after injecting interferon for a whole year into a patient with all the accumulated side effects. Then you can see uh, treatment improved with the introduction of ribavirin to interferon, and then we developed this new interferon I'll tell you about called pegylated interferon. That improved our success rates. And then we added ribavirin to pegylated interferon. And so you'll see up until about the, uh, the mid you know, 2010, 2011, uh, pegylated interferon plus ribavirin uh, was our treatment of choice. It was what we had, um, but we were only uh, anywhere in the 50 to 75% cure range. And then after 2013, you'll see we entered this interferon-free era of treatment with these drugs called DAAs, direct acting antivirals. So these are the drugs that were designed to specifically hit those enzymes of the hepatitis C. And you can see the cure rates for hepatitis C treatment went up to 100% with pills, no more interferon shots. So just as a uh, uh, background, interferon was the mainstay of treatment for many, many years for hepatitis C. Uh, we all make interferon, it's an antiviral, but it's, it mainly um, revs up the immune system against viral infections. And so when you get any type of infection, like a flu, the cold, our natural interferons are uh, revved up, and so you get the symptoms of interferon. Myalgias, um, fever, aches and pains, just the general flu-like blah, that's what interferon causes. So you can imagine when you're treating a patient with hepatitis C with interferon, you're telling them to inject interferon over the course of the year, you're making them feel awful like that for almost an entire year. And interferon had so many side effects and was very noxious that there were patients that we absolutely could not treat. And you can see you know, patients with severe cirrhosis, active drug use, psychiatric conditions, autoimmune disorders, uh, malignancies. These were patients that we could not treat with interferon. So think about how many hepatitis C patients are probably of this demographic. So even though there were a lot of patients with hepatitis C, you know, we couldn't treat a lot of them because interferon was just too powerful. So you treat a patient with interferon, you could tell them you can expect flu-like symptoms, nausea, emesis, hair loss, uh, worsening of psychiatric issues, a bone marrow suppression. So that's why patients said, oh yeah, they told me hepatitis C is like mini chemotherapy, and it was. When we treated these patients, we had to see them almost monthly in clinic, check CBCs, we'd have to use epogen, nupogen, we'd have to start antidepressants. It was really difficult to treat these patients, which is why we tried to find reasons not to treat them. So, that's, so this is what a patient could expect with one year of interferon treatment, just flu-like symptoms initially, but for the rest of the year, just general blah, fatigue, and just awful, awful side effects. So myalgias, headache, all these things went along with interferon. So it was very difficult to give. And the problem with interferon is that 
um, it didn't work in everybody. So if you were lucky and you were treated with interferon, if you were lucky, you would be what uh, we call a sustained responder. That's the, the graph in yellow. Your viral load would go to zero with interferon, and when you finished interferon, uh, the virus would be gone. So that's what we call a sustained response or cure. But unfortunately, most patients who were treated with interferon were either relapsers, you know, the virus came back after they finished, which was a real bummer, because here's a patient who went through a whole year of monthly clinic visits, tolerating all these terrible side effects. You know, you're telling them your virus is negative, it's looking good, it's looking good, and then at the end, the virus comes back. I mean, so many patients were incredibly depressed after doing this. Uh, and then the worst case were the non-responders, the ones that interfere on the virus didn't even budge with treatment. So if you look at the predictors of who were going to respond and who, who weren't, surprise, genotype 1, they were the worst responders. And, and what was the most prevalent genotype in the United States? Genotype 1. So here in the U.S., we had mainly genotype 1 patients. They responded the worst to interferon. So, you know, it wasn't, hepatitis C treatment was not a happy thing. So when we first started treating with interferon, it used to be giving them shots three times a week. You know, we used to do it for six months. The cure rate was about 12%. We decided, oh, let's make them suffer for a whole year, 48 weeks. Then we could cure about a quarter of them. So it was really awful. So as I mentioned, along came ribavirin, which is an oral pill. It works against hep hepatitis C, but it doesn't work by itself. It doesn't work by itself. But if you add it to interferon, it improves the response rates. Now the problem with ribavirin, it had its own side effects, and the big thing with ribavirin, it caused birth defects. So you know, when we treated a patient, male or female, with interferon with ribavirin, uh, we had to absolutely stress the importance of contraception because they could not get pregnant on treatment because of the high risk of uh, birth defects. So here, you know, we, you know uh, hepatitis C discovered in 1990. We first started treating with six months of interferon, 12% cure. So we said, let's treat them for a year. Now our cure rate went up to 24%. Well, let's see what it looks like with six months of interferon and ribavirin. We were about 31% cure. If you decided to treat them for a whole year, 38%. So for a long time, interferon, ribavirin for a whole year, we told patients about a third we could cure. But if you look, if you break it up by genotype, you can see that the genotype, you know, was significantly worse. So um, our American genotype 1 hepatitis C patients, so we were saying up, you know, in general about 30% cure rate. Along the way, a new type of interferon was developed called pegylated interferon, and PEG is polyethylene glycol. It was a molecule that was tacked onto regular interferon, uh, and what that did is it decreased the clearance of interferon. So in the old days, we had to give interferon three times a week, and we found out that patients injected themselves three times a week, but for most of the week, they actually had no interferon in their blood. So there were big periods where there was no interferon, and we felt maybe that's why it doesn't work so well. So with PEG interferon, you only need to give a shot once a week, and it's kind of released slowly over time. So now there's continuous level of drug in the blood over the course of the week. So we theoretically, we felt that PEG interferon would work better than regular interferon. So how did that look clinically in the studies? So here's regular interferon with uh, one, one year. Here's regular interferon with uh, ribavirin for one year. PEG interferon by itself was just as good as regular interferon plus ribavirin. So PEG interferon plus ribavirin for one year uh, cure rates overall about 65%. But again, break it up into the genotypes, and you look at the genotype 1 U.S. population, and our cure rates with one year of PEG interferon plus ribavirin was about 46%. So that was, you know, so I used to tell patients, you know, at least for the last 10 to 15 years, that was what we had. 
Patients referred to me for hepatitis C. I said, we could treat you with one year of PEG interferon plus ribavirin, 50-50 chance that I could cure you of hepatitis C. But you had all those terrible side effects and everything. So treatment was still not uh, optimal. Well, that was where we were for many years. And then literally just, uh, you know, this, so this came out in 2009. This was, this was supposed to be the, um, the next bar. This was supposed to be the, the new silver bullet for hepatitis C, the protease inhibitor. So remember, the protease is one of the enzymes in the virus. So telaprevir was approved, and telaprevir is a protease inhibitor. Unfortunately, you had to use it in combination with PEG interferon plus ribavirin. So we were now in the era of we call triple therapy, triple therapy for hepatitis C. So PEG interferon, ribavirin, and a protease inhibitor. Well, so there on the right in purple, you can see that's what the PEG interferon, ribavirin for one year, that's about the 40 to 50% cure rate. Add on a protease inhibitor, and we were looking at about 87%. People were like, wow, almost 90% cure for hepatitis C. So that was, you know, that was the new bar. Everyone was very excited until we found out that the side effects were even worse with the protease inhibitors. So the side effects were terrible, and the worst side effects was, was a rash. These protease inhibitors, especially telaprevir, could give this rash. And the rash was so significant, it could be a really terrible Stevens-Johnson's type rash that even ended in death for a number of patients. Uh, and so the FDA actually came back and, and, and put a black box warning on telaprevir, saying, uh, yeah, you can use it, but beware, it can cause death. So... You know, immediately our enthusiasm for the triple therapy just dropped like a rock. Um, and the company that makes telaprevir is no longer in the hepatitis C business. So that tells you just how terrible it was. So we had an initial excitement and then a huge letdown with the protease inhibitor. There was another protease inhibitor that came out called Bocepravir, same thing had to be used with PEG interferon plus ribavirin, so triple therapy. And you can see they were kind of in the 68, 70% cure range. So, I mean, if you look at the absolute cure rate, it was kind of impressive, but the side effects were really bad. And with Bocepravir, the big thing was anemia. We treated patients with triple therapy with Bocepravir, and we were admitting them for transfusions, and it was just awful. So. Initially, we were excited, and then we became very depressed. But along the way, while all this was happening, a number of drugs were in development, and these were what we call the DAAs, the Direct Acting Antivirals, the drugs that the companies were promising that we could use without interferon. So eventually, and you can see that this came out in just 2013, uh, the first of the DAAs came out, sofospivir. Uh, so this is the $1,000 a pill drug that you've all heard about, sofospivir. And uh, in these early phase studies, sofospivir was added to interferon plus ribavirin. So this is what the, this is what the newspaper articles don't tell you back, back then. They didn't tell you that. Uh, it wasn't sofospivir by itself. It was sofospivir plus interferon plus ribavirin. So it was still triple therapy. And we were kind of rolling our eyes saying, oh no, is this going to be this protease inhibitor business again? Well, it turned out, first of all, look at the cure rates. We were hitting, you know, above 95% in most patients, 100% in certain groups with sofospivir, interferon, and ribavirin. And surprise, you only need to, to take it for three months, not one year like the other stuff. So now we were telling patients, wow, triple therapy for three months, 100% cure. So this was the big thing. And we, we became very excited about this. And it turned out that sofospivir had none of the side effects associated with the protease inhibitors. So this was very impressive. But you know, sofospivir got a lot of bad press because it, it cost so much. 
So it was $1,000 a pill plus the cost of PEG interferon plus ribavirin. So we were talking, you know, hundreds, uh, $150,000, $175,000 for a three-month treatment course to cure hepatitis C. So it was very expensive. So you can look at, uh, in, in all patients, these are genotype 2, genotype 3 patients. But, but if, you, if you look, you know, genotype 1 patients, which were our U.S. population, again, look at those cure rates. It was really incredible, uh, upwards of 95 to 100%. Well, as it turned out, a second DAA called simeprevir was also approved about the time that sofosbuvir was approved. And some people, on the basis of a small study, someone said, wow, what if we throw out the interferon and the ribavirin? What if we combine sofosbuvir with simeprevir, two pills, uh, for three months? And so they did a small study called the COSMOS study, and the cure rates again pretty close to 100% with two pills. So suddenly we said, oh, now the problem was this wasn't FDA approved. This was off-label. We are taking sofosbuvir, which was FDA approved with interferon and ribavirin, and then we are taking simeprevir, which was FDA approved with interferon plus ribavirin, but we are throwing out the interferon and ribavirin and using the two pills off-label, but it worked so well that we started doing it. And the, but the issue was this was an off-label use. It was not FDA approved, so the insurance companies could legitimately say that's not an approved use for hepatitis C treatment, so we're not going to pay for it. So even though sofosbuvir and simeprevir work really well and you no longer needed interferon, uh, we couldn't get it for a lot of our patients. So that was what they were tickling us with, with the appetizer, because actually the main course was to come. Uh, so last year, um, the FDA approved this combination pill uh, of cefospivir plus lidiposphere, which is an NS5A inhibitor. So they took two pills, they took two medications, they combined them into one pill, cefospivir lidiposphere, and that pill is uh, what is called Harvoni. Harvoni is one pill a day for three months and 100% cure rate. And so that is, you know, what we have had since about November. So you can see hepatitis C um, treatment really now is just this one pill a day uh, for three months. Uh, the pill has very few, if any, side effects, and the cure rate is 100%. So this is why we're saying, you know, it's now en actually entering the realm of primary care medicine. Because, for example, just, you know, think about you have a patient that comes in, a uh, baby boomer, you screen them, they're hepatitis C positive, all right, here, take this for three months, you know, and I'll see you in six months for your routine follow-up care. No more hepatitis C. So that's Harvoni, another uh, regimen coming out. This one, this regimen uh, is uh, commercially available now, FDA approved. This one is called Vicurapac. It's actually three pills that you have to take. Um, but no interferon, just three pills. Uh, success rates are equally high. Um, and probably in another month or two, another treatment regimen will be approved. So we're gonna have at least three different uh, FDA-approved oral treatments for hepatitis C, which are basically uh, three months of popping a pill or three months of popping a combination of pills with very high cure rates, pretty much close to 100%. So, you know, that's really incredible. So I, I've basically kind of taken you through the whole hepatitis C story of discovery, uh, the treatments that we had to go through uh, to where we are now. Uh, there's still some uh, unknowns, and there's ongoing research. You know, we still need to know uh, what to do with our liver transplant patients with hepatitis C, our renal failure patients with hepatitis C, our HIV co-infected patients with hepatitis C. Uh, can we use these drugs successfully to prevent um, 
progression of liver cancer with hepatitis C. So uh, there's still some to learn, but I, you know, overall, I think uh, hepatitis C, as I mentioned, is probably going to be gone uh, in about three years. Uh, hepatitis C will be gone, um, and uh, but we have fatty liver still. <laughs> so. Uh, there's still about 5 million Americans with hepatitis C. It's incumbent upon us to, to uh, screen the necessary patients, to diagnose the disease. Um, yes, you can do fibro scans, liver biopsies uh, to figure out how much disease they have. I think the only reason now that we um, stage our patients is to see if they have cirrhosis or not. Um, we don't stage anymore to decide whether we want to treat, because we can easily treat all of them. But if they have cirrhosis, we know we have to screen for liver cancer. So any patient with cirrhosis needs to be screened for liver cancer. And even if you treat their hepatitis C and clear their hepatitis C, if that patient had cirrhosis, then even after clearance of hepatitis C, they still need to be screened. And that's it. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. We have time questions. for questions. Uh, hold your hands up for the microphone. I, I think we've got some people in the front here yet. Oh, one second. One second. Oh. Do all patients that have positive hepatitis C virus RNA, even though they have normal liver function, need to be treated? First question. The second question is, what is the cost of these oral drugs for the primary care doctor? Um, and three, how do you determine cirrhosis? I'm sorry to ask you all those questions. No, that, those are very good questions. So, uh, so the, the first question, um, if a patient, so you bring up a very good question. I think I'll take this time to talk about now because that is the big issue. You know, if you have a patient who you diagnose with hepatitis C and yet they have no evidence of cirrhosis or liver disease or anything, do you need to treat them? Say the patient feels fine, looks fine, everything's great. You, you guesstimate that they're probably going to be one of those 80% that will live a full healthy life whether they have hepatitis C or not. Do you need to treat them? And that is really the question and, it, and the main driver of that is the cost because these pills are still expensive. You know, they're still, you know, the Harvoni is still in the realm of $1,000 a pill. So you can do the math, you know, three months of $1,000 a day. So, you know, that's how much it costs. Uh, so the major problem that we have, I, I, I now tell everyone that the hardest part of hepatitis C treatment is getting the insurance approval. But it truly is because the insurance are asking those questions. Do you need to treat this stage fibrosis stage one patient? I mean, do we need to spend $90,000 to treat this patient when it's probably not going to change their life expectancy or anything? And, uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's still debatable. There's a lot of insurance companies out there that will not you know, approve treatment unless we can show them that the patient is stage three or stage four cirrhosis. And, um, but, but part of the issues that are coming up now, part of the Affordable Care Act is uh, um, there's, a, there's a lot of money that has been allotted um, for further research on the natural history and health outcomes of hepatitis C in that Remember I mentioned that we used to think hepatitis C was asymptomatic, but it is turning out that hepatitis C infection can cause non-hepatic or extra-hepatic symptoms that could lead to things like decreased productivity, poor quality of life, things like that. And so there's a lot of studies going on now to look at, well, what's the cost or the opportunity costs that are lost as a result of letting a chronic hepatitis C patient with chronic fatigue or arthritis or something, you know, what are the medical costs associated with that? What's the cost of lost productivity at work? All these things. They're trying to tease out, you know, whether we should be treating patients with no significant disease or not. And, and the companies are, I mean, Gilead actually, to their credit, has actually come down on the cost of Harvoni by 40%. 
I had a couple questions. One was, you said FibroScan is for a test that you guys are getting to get one. What about a Fry brochure? And then I was curious about the HIV, HCV co-infected patient. At what point is their immune system good enough to start an H a hep C medication? And last question, the patients that are IV drug users or if you cure them and they get reinfected, are they gonna be able to get that paid for? So as far as the first question, so the fibro scan uh, is, is distinct from all those other things like fibrosure, fibrospec. Um, fibrosure, fibrospec, those are blood tests that you order and then they report as either, uh, they report it as F01 or F234. So they're not very helpful because if you want to, because that, you either get a result of F0, F1, or F234. So if you have a patient who might be fibrosis stage two or three or four, and you order the blood test, the fibrosure is not gonna distinguish for you. It's just gonna tell you your patient is in the F234 category. The fibro scan is actually a machine that will actually distinguish between F0, one, two, three, and four. So it's much more accurate than the blood tests. Um, and I forgot what the second question was. Um, Oh, an H oh, what immune system? Oh, well, so, so the interesting thing is with the new, uh, if you have an HIV co-infected patient, in the old days when we use interferons, the interferon requires the host immune system to fight the virus. So if an HIV co-infected patient had AIDS and, and very poor immune system, the likelihood that treatment with interferon would work was very low. But the newer drugs, like you know, the, the new direct-acting antivirals, they don't require immune system. They directly act on the virus. So you can treat an HIV co-infected patient who has you know, advanced disease or not uh, with these new hep C drugs. You don't have to worry about the immune system um, with the newer drugs. And the last question was the, if they get reinfected, would that be something that would be covered? Um, well, uh, yeah, if you treat somebody with hepatitis C and they clear the virus, they can become reinfected again uh, if, they, if they get contaminated blood. Yeah. Oh, will insurance cover? <laughs> uh, you know, quite frankly, I haven't had a patient. I haven't had that, ex you know, I don't know, actually. Um, I don't know. What? Uh, which is the screening test? Uh, is it the HCV RNA or which test? I, you know, I, I actually recommend checking the HCV RNA because you, you can check the antibody test, but um, there is a false negative rate and a false positive rate with the antibody test, and so um, we just directly check for the virus now.